Welcome to the second part of my talk on how to make quantum invariance easier. This is joint work with Dora Barnatan. My name is Roland van der Veen from the University of Groningen. So recall from last time that we discussed an invariant Z related to the Drinfeld double of some algebra of an odd. And so this I want to briefly relate to the more usual Rashidikin derive invariants, dangles and knots. And so the relation is that this is an element of some algebra D. And so you can choose a representation rho into endomorphisms, which is matrices. And then this, this makes the relation. So you, you basically just represent your invariant. But my point of today is not to do this. So I do not want to consider representing my algebra. I want to stick to the algebra itself because this is a more powerful thing and it is also more direct. So again, this is where the scaling relations live. This is where many of the usual quantum invariant discussions go. But I want to emphasize that this is a choice. It is not a necessity. You can do without. So today we will do without representations. Right. So what can we say about this? Well, I claim this has good properties. So Z has good properties that are not necessarily satisfied here. You have to work much harder and they're less obvious there. So they are good properties. For example, uh, if you want to double a strand and you're not. So if you want to you have a strand and you double it like this, then on the algebra side, what you have to do is simply remember it was a Hopf algebra we were discussing. So you take the co-product and you apply it to the invariant of the knot you started with. So this does not mean a trivial strand. It just means a knot, a strand of a knot where you double. Okay, and same thing with uh, reversing a strand. If I reverse a strand, you can just apply the antipode in D. So this is in D d to your invariant and so these are powerful properties that directly related to um, the topology of knots for example habiro's work on bottom tangles this is habiro this is a good reference if you want to know more about this universal invariance, as it is called, universal invariant, and how these topological properties give you lots of interesting relations. What I want to focus on today is to make things easier, not just good properties, but also effective properties. So let me add to this one. This has good properties, but also uh, Z needs to effectively computable not invariants. Because you see the not itself is a great not invariant, but it's not very useful, right? So in topology to have anything, any kind of um, application, uh, we, we need to have something that is somehow simpler than the not itself. And so this is again why representations may not be the way to go because they make things harder often, not simpler. So to, uh, to make progress on these things, I, I want to um, treat two key ideas. So two key ideas. One is generating functions. And two is truncation of the algebra. And this together will lead will lead us to a multi variant that has good both good properties and is computably uh, effectively computable. So by effective, I mean it can compute in it can be computed in polynomial time not in exponential time like you do if you start applying the scaling relation to compute, say, the Jones polynomial or some other 
invariance that, that quickly gets out of hand, basically because the tensor product grows exponentially if you tensor and tensor and tensor, that is not going to end well. All right, so I want to start with generating functions, but to make things concrete, we focus, focus on the special case where D is the Trinfeld double of the algebra O, where O is generated by A and X with some very simple commutation relation. So A X minus X A equals X, also known as bracket. Right. Um, actually, this is supposed to be a Hopf algebra, so there is much more to say. Delta X, for example, would be E to the minus A tensor X plus X tensor one and so on, and then you didn't do the drift for double construction, and then you will find that this D is approximately, roughly speaking, this is just the very familiar UQ SL2. And so what I'm going to say in the next 20 minutes or so is intimately related to the invariance of SL2, invariance of knots, and so this is also related to the colored Jones, polynomial. But I hope to present an, a different viewpoint on, on these very familiar things. Um, right. So all everything I, I, will, I will say, so note everything works more generally. at least for UQG. So it has nothing special about SL2, except that it makes things a little bit concrete. Right? Now, what do I want to do? I want to focus on these two things in the, in the context of this simpler algebra, uh, where you can actually make it very concrete what I'm, what I'm going to say. And so I'll start with part one. Part one, this is the generating functions. Generating functions for compu doing computations in this algebra O and hence also in the algebra D. And so um, the algebra, to so to compute in O, order the variables generators um, alphabetically so a before x so computing means say if you see an x times an a then we will always quickly look at the brackets and say that this is actually a minus one times x right and so if you have more complicated combinations of these things you can always order because that is the nature of this relation. But this, this ordering gets very tiring and complicated and so we would like to speed this up and make it more conceptually what we're, easy what we're doing. So for that we're introducing a generating function for the multiplication, this is called M. So M, M sums up, let me use a lowercase m. The one, so the generating function M sums up all we need to know about multiplication in O. Okay, and so what is M? Well, M is the following. M is e to the alpha one, A, and I'll get back to why and how and what, but for now I'll just write it down. Alpha two, A 
e to the xi of 2x. And so this happens to also be uh, expressed as follows. You can reorder the terms once and for all. And so I'm only going to do this once. You can check. But for the discussion, it is not so important now why this is so. It's just that it is so. There is some expression like this. Okay. Now, using this, I claim I can treat any computation with this, this relations because you see, I can use the, so using the identity, very simple identity, which is somehow very important. So let me write it in a very big font. F of S, whatever S, whatever F. So this is a general fact. The general fact says that this f of s can be computed by doing ds, sorry, by replacing f of s by f of dz, and then differentiating s times z and setting z to zero. So this may come out of nowhere. This is a very common thing to do in generating functions also. In quantum field theory, this is often used. And so we will also use it here. And I'll erase a bit to make room for an example of how this is done. So here comes the example. So suppose we want to compute a times x squared times a. This is not particularly hard, but I'm just trying to illustrate by a simple example this very general procedure. So the point is not that what I'm doing is hard, but that it's, it is somehow uniform and makes all the computations coming out in the same way to such a degree that you really don't have to do the computations anymore. You can just look at M, M contains it all. So it's in some sense, no need to do the computations anymore. So let's, uh, so what I mean is this, this is something uh, where now this, this should be ordered alphabetically, right? So I want to get this alphabetically. So I claim it is A minus is it a x square? Not quite, because it's not. A, it's also not this, but it is some deformation of this. We will see. Um, but you can also figure it out yourself. Instead, I will ask M what is it. So M to to make contact with M, I will I will say it this way. I'll say x square a. This is the same as d of. Uh, d of alpha 1, d of psi 1 squared, d of alpha 2 applied to m, where then I set alpha equals psi equals 0. So both alpha 1 and alpha 2 and psi 1 and psi 2 are 0. So the m I'm referring to is the m here. And if you look at the first expression and you differentiate with respect to alpha 1, you see an, an a1 an a drops down. If I differentiate with respect to psi 1, you get exactly x, an x, but I want two x's, so I differentiate twice. And if you differentiate with respect to alpha 2, you get another a, but it's ordered like so. So this, this seems like the right expression. And what I'm doing here is completely general. But now let's see what, how this interacts with the expression of m. This the second expression of m, because that will actually tell us what the answer is. So here we go. Uh, I'm just going to differentiate. But one of the nice things about differentiation is that the differential operators commute, right? So I can choose which one to do first according to my own preferences. So I, I choose to first differentiate with respect to alpha 1. That seems easiest. If I differentiate with respect to alpha 1, um, I'm going to use the second expression here. Um, if I differentiate with respect to alpha 1, I'll just get an a1, uh, sorry, an a. And then I set alpha 1 to 0. And so I get d psi 1 square d alpha 2 m. 
still at alpha equals zero, right? So this is the same, but now I can keep going and now differentiate twice with respect to Xi1, the M. So now look at what Xi1 is not here, but instead here. So it has a factor, uh, it has a coefficient e to the minus alpha two. And so the e to the minus alpha two comes in front with a square. So I will get a and I will get d alpha two. And then in front with a square, I'll get x times e to the minus alpha two. But I get this squared. And this is great, but I also have an a and m left. So I should write it this way. Maybe I can move it like this. This a we had, this differentiation I carried out, this one I did not carry out yet. So that's still there. But here there is also an m. And this is still evaluated at alpha equals psi equals zero. Right? So this is probably hard to follow. Um, but it is the essence of making life easier. So that's why I'm taking the time to actually do this computation. It's, it seems the, the sort of the worst way to do this, but it's actually the best way from my point of view. So last, last step, we're going to differentiate once more with respect to alpha two. And let me write out what is M now. So this is A and in M there is a E to the alpha two times a, but here there's also minus two alpha two, and then there is an x square, and this is all evaluated at alpha two equals zero. And so finally, what we're concluding here is that if we carry out this final differentiation, then this will be equal to a times, well here the coefficient, sorry, I forgot my differentiation. Here the coefficient with respect to alpha two is a minus two. So this is a times a minus two times x squared. Now I set alpha two to zero, so the exponent vanishes. And this is the end result. And so what I'm what I apparently get is so conclusion. Our conclusion is that a x squared a equals a times a minus two x squared. And instead of doing this sort of the pedestrian way by just working out the, the commutations, instead what we did was we had this universal m, this expression m, which has two forms, one in standard form and one not in standard form. And using both, we know that we can read off any, we can write any monomial or any polynomial in terms of M as a differentiation. And then we can use the other expression for M to simply carry out this differentiation. And then we will get the ordered version. So the point is that M has two shapes. It has an ordered shape and an unordered shape. And this is exactly what you need to be able to multiply. All right. So this is a very general feature that you can pull through with all algebraic structures. Here I just mentioned the multiplication, which is governed by this. But here is the call multiplication and there is a whole bunch more and then there is also the Drinfeld double and all those constructions you can all encode in similar universal exponential generating functions. And this will make things much, much easier. It's a bit too much light. So Get a little bit more shade. All right. So next, I want to move on to, to part two. So this is all I wanted to say about generating functions. Now the truncations. Um, the truncations. I can be short. It's a very simple idea. And so I could illustrate it here in the algebra I already have on the board, because you see what we can do is we can introduce a parameter epsilon. So let me make it red. 
a red epsilon. And so this red epsilon, what it will do is it will truncate things. So I'm going to introduce it here. I'm going to multiply the x by epsilon. And so everything I said still goes through, except now I have an epsilon. And so what I can do is I can and now expand, so Taylor expand if you want, expand in epsilon, in epsilon. So everything I get will be series in epsilon. And so instead of this single algebra, I get a series of algebras depending on epsilon. So let me write that down. So we get, get a series of algebras, a family of algebras depending on epsilon. But so if we think about the Taylor series, then this is approximating. So this is approximating. approximating the original. And so here you can already see that if epsilon is zero, then A and X are simply commuting, but maybe epsilon is not zero, but maybe epsilon squared is zero. And so then they don't commute, but if you commute twice, then they will commute, right? And so, so things get more and more interesting and hard. And so you can express everything as a series. And so also the not invariant will now be, let me write that here because it's important. So we get, get a series expansion of ZD in epsilon. So let me write ZD is some ZI of a knot, right? And here, epsilon to the i. Right? And so these things may be much, much easier to work with, but still, if we have the whole series, then we still get the whole invariant. So this seems to be related to, related to the loop expansion. of color Jones. And so this is work of Rosansky. Although to me the relationship is not quite clear yet because here, if I say color Jones, then I'm representing things. Whereas I promise not to use representations and instead work with the original algebra. And so just to make things more concrete, so our M now looks like if I start truncating it or approximating it like so, then it will look like Psi one plus Psi two X, but here you get one plus, uh, sorry, one minus, one minus alpha two Psi one uh, Epsilon X plus O of epsilon plus O of epsilon squared. So to first order, M becomes much, much simpler. It's almost just a Gaussian, but there's a small perturbation. This brings me to the final bit of my talk. So the invariance di can all be computed using perturbed ordered Gaussian expressions generating functions. 
So I'm returning to the viewpoint of the generated functions and I'm claiming you can write everything in terms of very simple generating functions. And let me just finish with writing those. So the generating functions I'm, I want to mention are just two, just the, the crossing x i j, this is x j y i minus y j plus minus one. This is the crossing and then the multiplication m i j is something very similar x times psi one or psi i psi j plus y or eta i eta j times y plus still in the exponential plus one minus t uh, psi i eta j all right so finishing up um this is not quite right this is the first order approximation so i should write one plus o of epsilon and that nicely sums up what we're trying to do here this is an exponential times one plus o epsilon and so you can actually carry out all these computations effectively in polynomial time on the computer by doing expansions in epsilon and also generating functions so i prepared some more material but i think i should finish up and just refer you to the website um, of the conference for more information i'll put in particular a demonstration mathematica file so see website for actual demonstration of z0 which is just alexander that's not very shocking but z1 is interesting and i think very powerful for applying to topology for the reasons i just mentioned it is easy to compute it is very strong and it is also blessed with these good properties namely for strand doubling and strand reversal and some more and so this is the main thing i wanted to direct your attention to this uh and so the pair z z0 z1 are uh, already this already uh separates or not in the Wolfson table, so up to, to 10 crossings. So in that sense, it is stronger than Kofanov and homology and Humphrey polynomial, which do not distinguish as many. Um, but more important than just being strong, I want to emphasize that this is, it may look complicated with all these gener generating functions and truncations and so, but again, this is made this is made so that it is easy, easy for a computer and also easy for a human, easy to prove things, easy to compute things. And so I think this is an interesting direction to pursue. Thank you very much.